Good morning, Ebenezer. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. It's so good to be back. I, I think many of us had a nice spring break, a little vacation, and we're thankful for the travel mercies and blessing our vacation time. And if you didn't get a vacation, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Every day is a blessing, and we're Easter people all the time, and we survived our Easter week, uh, Holy Week. Great festivities, great fun, and I do feel refreshed and rejuvenated. It's kind of miraculous. I, I feel like that whole Lent season and really, really is working. I feel like a kind of on a transition again, and it's great. I hope everybody feels that way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, when we are frightened and, and doubt begins to creep into our minds, may our hearts burn as you speak to us through the Holy Spirit and your scriptures. Open our eyes that we may see you in each other and in the miracles around us. Open our minds that we may better understand the scriptures and be effective witnesses of all that you have done and want to do for those who believe. Amen. Amen. Amen.
continue standing and join together with our affirmation of faith in the Apostles' Creed, you can find it on page 881 of your opinion. <laughs> 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 we believe in God, our Father Almighty.
Julie, like all of us, is wonderfully made, more beautiful today, inside and out, with each passing day. We thank God for Julie and wish her a very happy birthday. Amen. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Psalm 139, verse 13. Uh, lots of things going on. We already mentioned getting ready for the cookout, and we have a yard sale, guard garage sale, whatever we call it, coming up. Big spring yard sale. I uh, encourage you to look at all these announcements. We have lots of things going on as usual, Bible studies and meetings, and chili cook-offs, first aid training, and oh, the Dixie Jubilee Band. I'm really looking forward to that. going to be here in a couple of weeks. All right. Um, Time for the ushers to come forward? No, we'll do a whole prayer first. <laughs> Peter's been on vacation, he's still. <laughs> now we've been uh, we've been very blessed in so many ways. Just so grateful for the people that the Lord has brought here. I'm, I continue to be amazed by the talent and the gifts by the folks who have walked through these doors. Of course, then it's our responsibility to use all those gifts and talents and, and hopefully be kept accountable of that. We start everything with prayer. It's one of the most important things we do is to you know, just seek the Lord's favor, seek His will, pray that the Lord would intercede on the behalf of, of our loved ones. We've experienced many miracles here that we're grateful for, but you know what? We want a bunch more. Amen. We need healing. Uh, whether that's physical healing, uh, those who struggle with emotional challenges and relationships that we have made a mess of. We worship a God who is still in the miracle business. So we want to be faithful in all we do in, in our prayer. We start every week off here at 9 a.m. in prayer. We invite you to be a part of that. If you have a specific prayer concern, and if you look, there's cards and a few of heavy, if you want to write those down and put them in the offering plate. And the other thing is, while God answers prayer, it's our responsibility to give thanks and to remember. So we have a little jar of awesome over there. The jar of awesome, that's meant for answered prayer. Anything that you want to lift up as a thanksgiving. Or it could just be that you were down at the beach and you saw God's hand in this world of wonder. Write it down and drop it in that jar. We, we read those as well on Monday morning, and it's, and it's always a blessing seeing that uh, the people have shared. So, uh, well, with that in mind, it's great to see you all here. Is there any particular specific prayer concerns anybody would like to lift up or a particular Thanksgiving? Well, yeah. Oh, I have a podium up here. Can I yeah, come on, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> you want the podium, Bob? I don't want to I just want to say, and this is just right now, this is what, how I feel. Since I joined the church, my eyes have opened. My heart is full. And now my heart is being worked on. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a heart, which is good. <laughs> and I've always, I've always kind of sometimes prayed like, you know, slow me down, Lord, in the pounding of my heart. Because sometimes I just get so, and my husband knows that. And I'm like, chill. I can't. So I got this great blocker. And it took yesterday, and it's like, everything just went, okay. And listen to your body, people. If you don't feel good, go to the doctor. Don't just think it's okay. Because, I mean, I am so grateful, and I'm so thankful for everybody. And God is good, and I love you all. And that's all. <laughs> As a, a heart monitor on for a couple of days, just checking to see, uh, make sure that, that she's okay. And then uh, her and Dennis are leaving later today. They're taking a little trip in their RV. And there's a lesson in that to all of us. You go on vacation, either, either your best choices are to leave Sunday after church <laughs> or come back on Saturday. <laughs> So if you only have to miss one Sunday, so be it. If you miss none, that's better. So. <laughs> yeah, yes? I'd like to pray that Candy has a safe trip to Denver. Yeah, my, uh, Candy is going to Denver tomorrow to go hang out with our daughter, Becca. Yay. I'm staying here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> I'll be here. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, it is, uh, it is wonderful to see everybody here today. We've just been so blessed. And it's been sort of a, sort of a week of rest after Easter, which was really an amazing experience for many of us. But let's take a moment. Let's, uh, let's have our uh, hearts in a, in, a, in a time of meditation. Let's prepare ourselves for prayer. Lord, in the serenity and the peace of this sanctuary, we seek your presence, that you might pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and guide us into all truth. Lord, give us eyes that are wide open to see and ears that we can hear. And Lord, that our hearts would be sensitive to where it is that you are at work, that we might join you in your work, Lord. Now that we celebrate the healing, the miracles that we've experienced here, you know it's our desire, Lord, we would see even more healing, that we would know your presence in healing relationships that have been strained and those who are suffering from anxiety and stress, Lord, that we indeed would rest in your presence. Father, I give you thanks for the laughter and the joy that is found here. And we just pray that we would do nothing to get in the way, that we would not be a stumbling block to anyone that you desire to reveal yourself to. Lord, we give you thanks. For new members, we give you thanks, Lord, for Kim's decision and just for the wonderfully gifted people, those selfless volunteers that have come through here. Lord, may we be wise stewards of all that we have been given, using the, uh, the opportunities we have, not wasting a day. And so, Lord, as we gather here, we just celebrate and pray for the churches that surround us, regardless of their denomination, regardless of their size, Lord. We pray that the leadership would be godly leadership, that the gospel would be proclaimed, and that people would understand the hope that we have, the transformative hope, that nobody is too far gone, nobody is too far lost, Lord, that you cannot heal. And so for all these things, we give you thanks for what you've done, what you're doing now, Lord, and we know what you're planning on doing in the future. And for all these things, we celebrate in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> now with the ushers please come forward <laughs> and let's pray Father God thank you so much for loving us we love you right back and Lord help us to love each other in your name Amen, Amen. <laughs>
It's a Bible study link, and they had in the 25 most verse, most uh, recorded and, and searched scriptures. Uh, number one was like Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And of course, Psalm 23, often read, looked after. And there's just times in our life when, when we call upon the 23rd Psalm. 1 Corinthians 13th chapter where Paul's writing about love and the significance of love being patient and kind and not envying. Philippians 4.13. I know when Evander Holyfield used to sign autographs and would sign boxing gloves, he'd always put on there Philippians 4.13, just I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And of course, John 3.16, Romans 8.28, 8. We all know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. They've been called according to his purpose. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. You know, these scriptures that we call upon, that we learn from, that we meditate on, that we memorize. But there's one scripture, and I'm going to read this one today. There's one scripture that I find is the most astonishing in all the Bible from the 16th chapter of John. And if you'll, I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross, and he's basically giving his final messages to his disciples. And he says, All this I have told you, that you will not go astray. 
and though they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you at first because I was still with you. Now I'm going to the one who sent me, but none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I've said these things, you're filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment, in regard to sin because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said that the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So within that scripture I read, the seventh verse of the 16th chapter of John, Jesus utters these words that are unfathomable to me, and maybe you as well, that Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Now, wrestle with that one a little bit. If you know much of this at all, you don't really have to study it very deeply to know how clueless the disciples were, how hopeless and helpless that they were. And, of course, we know Jesus Christ, and and you don't have to even be a Christian to understand that the significance of Jesus Christ that time itself is marked by his life, B.C., A.D., the year of our Lord, that Jesus, even when he was with his disciples, he, he, at, at times he would get frustrated, and in Mark chapter 7, 17, he, he gets so angry, he says, are you still so dull? Don't you understand these things? And then at one point when the disciples are unable to free a man from a demon, and, and Jesus gets ready, he says, How long will I have to put up with you? The same disciples that Jesus says, it's for your good that I'm going away. How do you make peace with that? And then he says, he explains, he says, uh, for unless I go, uh, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Which raises another question. It's not an insignificant question. So if Jesus has all authority that's been given to him, right? If he's got all authority, why can't Jesus just invite the Holy Spirit to show up where he is and and, and so to to be a comfort and a blessing to the disciples? He says, unless I go, I can't can't bring the Holy Spirit to you. Let, Let me ask you, do you know any verses in Scripture more astonishing than these? Well, let's unpack them a little bit so maybe we understand better. So when Jesus said that he was coming here, and what we believe, our, our, our theology, our doctrine is that Jesus is with the Father and the Holy Spirit eternally. That they've been either from, from even before the creation of the world, that they were together, that Jesus is deity, he's God that had put skin on and came to earth. And that Jesus walked among us, and what he said, and if I ask you why, so why was Jesus coming to earth for? Why was he becoming as a man? And somebody might say, well, he came to die on the cross for our sin, and the answer is, that's not what he said. What he said in John chapter 10, verses 10, he said, I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly, which raises the question, if I already have life, why do I need other life? I'm already breathing. Jesus wasn't talking about physical life. He was talking about spiritual life, which then raises another question. 
Hey, I got physical life. He's going to come. He's going to bring me abundant life, which is everlasting life. Because we rarely talk about life. Either you're alive or you're dead. We don't really talk about life in quantity, right? But Jesus does. I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Why would I need life I already have? So it goes back to the very beginning. We talk about when Adam and Eve were created by God in his own image, born spiritually alive, and the Lord told them, you know, you, you have access to anything in this garden, but do not eat of that tree of knowledge, for if you do, you will surely die. You surely die. And of course, then they were tempted. They were tempted by Satan in the garden who said, oh, no, 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 you won't, you won't die. You have knowledge, you'll be like God. And so from the very beginning, Satan, a liar and a deceiver, tempts them, and they fall victim to the very first sin, which is still the great sin we suffer from today, which is ego, which is vanity. They think they can eat of this fruit and be like God, and so they do, but they didn't physically die. They lived a long, long time. But it wasn't that, that physical death. It was a spiritual death that after they ate of this tree of knowledge that they were told not to, the only thing would help from them. And we know what happened then is that God departed from their presence. God, who had been walking with them in the garden, left because what we know through our Scripture, a pure, holy, perfect God cannot dwell in the presence of sin. And so Adam and Eve, who were originally born in this perfection, spirit-filled, God walked with them and through sin into the world entered sin and death. That's what Scripture says. It's through the, through the sin of one man, through Adam, sin and death. And so what that means is that, that Adam and Eve, from the time that they were spiritually dead, every person born after that, every person from Adam and Eve, all the patriarchs, from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses, Isaiah, every single one born not in the image of God, but spiritually dead, physically alive. And so that's why Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. Scripture talks about through the sin of one man, sin and death, but through the second Adam, he brings forgiveness and life. So when Jesus said, I came to, they might have life and have it abundantly. If you said, well, Jesus came and he died for the sins, it's like, that's half the gospel. So today we're discussing the second half of the gospel. And if you've never heard this before, I'm sorry, you should have. If you've never heard this before, I would encourage you once again to, to, to sort of take notes because this is what the Christian life is all about. This is the very foundation of it, which is the one thing we all have to have as a Christian. They don't really care you know, where you're going to church, what you've learned. See, there's a difference between religion and Christianity. To be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, there's all one thing every single one of us has to have. Every single one of us. To have received freely of the Holy Spirit. No spirit, no life. And Jesus promises when you receive the Holy Spirit, then it's not just sealed, it's our hope of redemption that cannot be taken away. And it's for eternal life. So our struggle we get into, let's face it, even the church, when, let me ask you, you know, have you, have you done enough? Do you feel like you've been good enough that somehow you can be acceptable to God? Which is the, the, the basis of religion. Religion which leads to frustration, condemnation. Religion which leads to being judgmental. Right? There's no peace in it. So do you feel like you've done enough? Are you good enough? Have you somehow made yourself acceptable to God? Do you think that at the end of it that those scales are going to come out and say, well, Lord, I want perfect? Do you, do you think that, that maybe you're on that path? That you somehow can earn your way? That you do something that the Lord will have mercy on you because you've worked so hard? Let me uh, make this real abundantly clear. There's no chance in hell. There's nothing that you could do, ever could do. And, and that, that sort of self-effort is just an effort in frustration. Which is why Jesus put skin on and came to earth so that we would have life. The second half of the gospel is after we've been cleansed on the cross, 
for sin, when the original sin was dealt with through Jesus, we've then been purified, but we're still spiritually dead. And that's when we ask to receive the Holy Spirit. And by the way, no spirit, no life. All the things that we study in Scripture, they're all spiritually discerned. When Peter declares Jesus is the Christ, when, when Jesus says to the disciples, so who do the people say I am? In, in 16th chapter of Matthew, you say, well, you know, some say you're John the Baptist, come back. Some say Elijah, one of the prophets. And Jesus says, well, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ. You're, you're the only son that you're God. And Jesus said, Simon, son of Peter, blessed are you. This was not revealed by man, but by Father in heaven. See, it's the Lord's desire that we would know him, but there's a supernatural, spirit-driven purpose in this that allows us then to look through the Scripture and understand. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to us. It's that sensitivity, the, the awareness of truth. What, what's the Holy Spirit do? Guides us into all truth. How does the Lord describe the Holy Spirit? What Jesus says, he's an advocate, a comforter, the paraclete, that Greek word, Right? Advocate, it's like a defender, right? Somebody that you would have represent you in court. I love that, that terminology, this comforter, advocate. You know who Satan is? The evil one, you know who he is? He's the accuser. He's the accuser. And so what that means is the accuser is one waving his finger and saying, Lord, these people are unworthy of you. Look what a mess they are. And, and, and Satan points out, it's like, I can't argue with that, and I am a mess. What does Paul say? You know, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things, the things that I don't want to do, I do. He says, who will rescue me? What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And religion says, just work harder, Paul. Just read a little more, pray a little more. You know, do some more mission trips, and, and you'll find acceptance in God's sight. And the answer is, absolutely not. When you look in... Uh, in book of Revelation in the 12th chapter and it so adequately describes the nature that we have of the enemy the accusation the accusing nature and so Revelation 12 chapter 12 verses 10 through 12 says then I heard a loud voice in heaven now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before God day and night, has been hurled down. So we're talking about Satan, this accuser, accuses us when? Both day and night. There is no rest. And Satan's message is always, look at what a mess they are. Look how, how fall, they've fallen short. And then Jesus says he's going to send a Holy Spirit who is an advocate, a comforter, a representative, our defender. But then we go back to Jesus saying, it's better for you that I go, because unless I go, I cannot send the Holy Spirit to you. See, So this is how this, is how this, this all works. So from the sin and death that Adam and Eve brought in the world, sin and destruction, and so until the time of Jesus, that no one there is born spiritually alive until the, the time of Christ. It's like, imagine if, it's hard to do. Let, let's say, we're in, in Bobby was talking about discussing issues of the heart. Let's say if you were, you were born and you had a, a particular virus in your heart that made your heart weaker, and it wasn't discovered. And all you knew is every time you tried to do something, you ran out of energy. And every time you went out and wanted to play with the kids, you just, you just weren't up for it. And, and you know what the response would be from family and friends? You need to try harder. You know, you're just lazy. And the more you tried, the more effort you just couldn't do it. You didn't understand what was wrong, and, and everybody else just thought that you were making excuses, there was something wrong with you, and, and, and you seemed depressed, you seemed like you're anxious, so what do they do? You know, they're going to send you to a counselor, and they're going to say, well, you know, you just, you just need to quit being so lazy and get to the gym. And everything you try to do to gain more energy fails. And you go to the gym, you try to exercise, but what you do, it just makes it worse. And you're in this discouragement, this depression. And you don't know what's wrong, but something is wrong, and nobody, nobody is cutting you any slack. And you're waving fingers at you and telling you all these things that you ought to do better, and there ought to be a fix for it. And then eventually... 
a good doctor, a good physician, one who understands and can discern the truth, says you have this, this virus that's affected your heart and severely weakened it. The only solution is we're going to cure this virus and we've got to get you a new heart. You're going to live. And so, you go for that operation. First thing, they're not going to give you a heart transplant if you still have a virus, right? So the first thing you have to do is, is cure you of the virus. So the virus gets cured. We call the virus sin, right? We call that virus is that, that we're all afflicted with. And by the way, that sin affects every cell in our bodies. You don't have to teach kids to sin. It's as natural as breathing. I've been really good at it. As a matter of fact, and it all begins with this selfishness, this vanity, if I can go three minutes, if I go three minutes without thinking of anything but just myself, it is a miracle. We're born that way, that selfish nature. And so the, the, the virus gets cured then. The virus is fixed, but now I've still got a bad heart. So now we have to find a, a, a heart donor. We've got to find a, a heart transplant. Okay, and so when they do that, now we're going to perform surgery, cure the virus. Do they leave the old heart in you? Well, no. Well, why not? It's no good anymore. Right? So they remove the old heart, and they put the new one in, and then it starts to beat and pump, and, and life is flowing through you. Now, after they put the new heart in, it's beating. The, the surgical team doesn't say, let's go get some lunch. What do they do before that? They seal you up. Okay, so then imagine, okay, so we cured the virus, we gave you a new heart, sealed you up, you recover. Well, guess what your life is like then? It's like nothing you ever experienced before. You, as a matter of fact, you didn't know what you didn't know, and that's our issue. When we're spiritually, when we don't have the, the Holy Spirit, says, nothing makes sense to us. You don't know what you don't know. But now that you have this new heart, all of a sudden you look back and you say, that's why. I, I felt this depression and anxiety, and, and I was so tired. Nobody understood it. But now this is what life is supposed to be. So now you've got all this energy. And what are you going to do with that energy? You can't wait to start climbing mountains. You can't wait to go on long walks. You can't wait to go snow skiing. You can't wait to run around the bike. Matter of fact, you don't want to sleep anymore. You feel so good. All you want to do is be active. And how many Christians, you get a heart transplant, and it's like, I'm going to sit in the basement and play video games. No. I want you to know the essence of it, and it's been this transformation from the inside out. So for Christians, it's not what we do, it's not the effort, it's a matter of identity. If you've known people, and I sure hope you, you do know some people, whose lives have been so transformed from being so messed up, and such horrible backgrounds, and, and dealing with terrible issues, and yet when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them, and what do you see in their eyes? There's this countenance about them. There's something new. There's like a light that goes on inside. They're transformed. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It's Christ who lives in me. That's why when Jesus says to Nicodemus, he's a rabbi, he's a teacher. He knows all about the law. And Jesus says, I, I, I tell you the truth, uh, unless you're born again, you're never getting into heaven. What's Nicodemus say? Oh, I, I'm an old man. I'm going to climb back in my mother's womb. He's talking about a natural birth, and Jesus said flesh gives birth to flesh. And by the way, flesh and blood will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's impossible. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit to spirit. So Jesus talks about a spiritual birth. John's baptism was a water baptism, right, of repentance. Jesus' baptism is with fire and the Holy Spirit. It's, a, it's not a consuming fire, much as it is, it's a refining fire to purify us. That's why, the most exciting thing I hear in this church, people walk in and say, I just felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I, I've heard that so often, is that I, I'm, I'm not surprised anymore. I've had people walk in this empty sanctuary and say, I felt the presence of the Lord here. I had folks, a man goes to a, a Baptist church up the street, he says, you know, I drove by your church, I felt the Holy Spirit driving by the church. Well, then stop in. The Spirit guides us into all truth, our advocate, our comforter, and it's the accuser who wags the finger and talks about all the things. Because this world, and let's say, and who's winning the battle? Well, Scripture says the prince of this world, who is Satan, has already stand condemned. But the thing is, 
we take this such the heart, we feel so inadequate or I've messed up, and, and the focus goes back on me instead of on Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, is that because of that, then we end up being within the church. We end up being judgmental, you know, end up wagging a finger. And so I become an accuser. Well, that's the Lord's job to judge, right? So the problem is then, is that while the Holy Spirit is about, is about providing comfort and defense, being a counselor, when I'm being critical of others, when I'm wagging a finger, whose who's kingdom am I representing? Don't talk behind people's backs. Don't send that email. Don't even think it. Because that is not of God. And so where the conviction comes in, once we become spirit-filled, you know what changes? Everything. It's a heart transplant. And so now the answer is, once you receive this, this change from the inside out, you want to tell other people about it. So imagine if you went that scenario and you got your heart transplanted, all of a sudden life is like you never knew it before and, and you're all lit up. It's like, man, this is what, what life was supposed to be like. And then you found other people who had the same condition, had the same virus. Would you slink off into a corner and not tell them? You'd grab by the lapels and say, I know what's wrong with you. you got a virus. It can be cured. And we'll get you a new heart. you live forever. That's our responsibility, is to receive and then tell others. To be light in the world and let folks know it's not what we do. It's never about what we do. It's who we are. And so the reason Jesus said this then, the disciples, is that what he was going to do by going to the cross, he was going to deal with the virus. And so this great exchange of the cross, it says that he died for sins, and not just ours, but for the sins of the whole world, right? That's what Scripture says. So when he goes to the cross and pays that price... He who knew no sin. The perfect man who became sin. So it's like all, all, my, all my bloody rags, all these things, all my sin goes with him to the cross and exchange. I get his cloak of righteousness. So now the virus is gone and I've been purified, but I still need a new heart. See, I, I still, and that's the second half of the gospel that we often don't discuss. The second half of the gospel we don't understand is Christ died for my sins and then he freely offers his Holy Spirit and everything changes. So the first thing the Holy Spirit does when you receive the Holy Spirit, conviction of sin. It reminds you of all the things I was comfortable with, all the things that I had no problem with, all the things I could argue with you and, and, and feel 100% comfortable. All of a sudden I'm arguing with the Holy Spirit. You know how that works? It doesn't. So the Holy Spirit's constantly whispering, talking, and deals with each one of us individually. That's why, you know what Scripture says about the New Testament? It's not a law written on stone. It's not commandments written on stone. You know what the New Covenant is? In the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 31, it says, After that time, says the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will write the law on their hearts and in their minds. It's individual. It's the Holy Spirit whispering to us exactly where we are because the Lord knows us that well to deal with each one of us individually. And so the Holy Spirit whispers to me, my question is, am I listening? That still, small voice. The Holy Spirit who wants to bring me into all truth but also conform me to the likeness of Jesus Christ. And here's how this works. Is that we invite the Holy Spirit in. Or pours that. Then... Now, it's, it's no longer just a, a natural man, but now we, we have the Spirit of God. And you know what the fruit of the Spirit is? Well, we have, you know what the fruit of the Spirit is? It's only one fruit. What's the number one? Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Matter of fact, if you're a Christian, you don't have joy. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. doesn't mean you're not born again. It, it, it just means you're living in error. That's why we read the Bible. The, the, the Bible is, is our plumb line. God just in all truth. That's why it's good news. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Is there peace in your life? That doesn't mean you're not born again. It means you're just living in error. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Are you gentle? I didn't used to be gentle. Self-control. Do you have self-control? What's well, a gift of the Holy Spirit that we have to have the opportunity to listen. To listen. So Jesus told the disciples, says, 
it's for your own good that I'm going because Jesus could not send the Holy Spirit to them while they were still alive because they were still dead in their sin. They were still immersed in their sin. And so when Jesus went to the cross and took the virus of sin away, now they were cleansed but still dead. And Jesus says, I'm going to breathe on you. And what was there, the sign of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? That little flame over their heads. And you know what changed after they received the Holy Spirit? Everything. Everything changed. There was nothing about them that was the same. And what they thought, what they did, how they acted, because the transformation was inside out. That's what the Lord offers. Matter of fact, in Luke chapter 11, you know what it says? It says, how much more will God freely give the Holy Spirit to who? You know who gets the Holy Spirit? He freely gives the Holy Spirit to who? All who ask. All who ask. I don't know about you, but when I was comfortable in my sin and my world view and and, uh, how my life was, very comfortable in my job and relationships and uh, had a nice car and a full head of hair and uh, life was good. It was good. You know? Everything was working for me. But it was weird, though, is... You know, when I felt like God was trying to whisper to me and get my attention, you know what I, what I did? I, I'd run as fast as I could. I don't want to hear it. Matter of fact, people that have a disquiet spirit, folks that can never sit down and be alone, can't, can't be at peace, you know why I was running? I didn't want to hear from God because I was afraid He was going to whisper something to me I didn't like. So it was almost like turning the knob down on the radio. I didn't want to hear it. And so I would constantly just try to keep moving and try to keep ahead because I was afraid the Lord was going to try to talk to me and say something I didn't want to deal with. And then one day, I was curious enough to want to slow down and to see if there's anything the Lord may want to say to me that I want to hear, to slow down and actually maybe listen. And and the the funniest thing is when when the Lord did indeed speak to me, it wasn't audible, and hear voices, because the Lord speaks in your heart and your mind. and And I had this realization, the whole time I thought I left the Lord in the distance, I had this overwhelming sense this over I, I can't describe it to you that when it was almost like I picked up my shoulder and the Lord was right there the entire time I thought he was far away the Lord is near seek him while he can be found how much more so would the Lord pour out his Holy Spirit on all who ask you know we do a lot of things when we you know either you know, people walk up the aisle and ask to be forgiven or repent or get on knees and pray. You know, it, it's, a, it's really as simple as desiring the Lord to give us this gift. But you have to be careful. I, I don't know what you may be involved in. I, I know the things in your life that, that, you, that you may enjoy, you want to get rid of. Be careful. You, you allow the Holy Spirit to have your life. It'll turn your world upside down. It'll change everything. You don't get to keep any, any part of yourself. I, I love this. Uh, somebody wrote this some years ago. I don't know who the author is, but... I think it's so appropriate for the church. There's there's probably nothing worse in the church than lukewarm Christians. You're killing us. You're killing us. You know, you go out there and you know, and, and you're like this. People ask what church you go to and everything. It's how is it? Well, you know, it's okay. You know, it. Someone once wrote. They said, "I'd like to buy five dollars worth of God. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk." or a snooze in the sunshine. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a rebirth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I'd like to buy $5 worth of God. You want $5 worth of God or you want the whole thing? The Lord says, all you have to do is accept His gift on the cross and I'll take a moment. I said this at 8.30. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to pray along with me because I've got no prayer that can help. It's up for you to ask. So we're going to take a moment of silence. And if you've never been clear about your desire to be forgiven and receive the Holy Spirit, we're going to give you this opportunity, or even to renew that value to, to be Spirit-led, because we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and, and still ignore the voice of God. The question is whether you want to be discerning and listen and receive and be transformed from the inside out. For the virus to be dead and to get a new heart. I'll give you a minute.
opportunity. As a matter of fact, if anybody wants to come forward and, and come to the altar, there's no magic words, there's no magic about the altar, but it's here, we might as well use it. So if anybody feels compelled and you want to do that, now's the time. Let's, let's pray in silence. Four twenty. If y'all stand and uh, we're going to sing four twenty. And Kim, if you come forward at this time. Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.